came to see Mary. She was doing laundry, and then the angel just appeared and she was really scared. So Gabriel was like, Mary, you're gonna have, what? I can't, I can't say it good. Mary, you're gonna have a baby. I, you're gonna have a baby and you will call him Jesus. And then Mary was like, I'm not gonna have a baby yet. I'm only a teenager and I'm not married. Then the angel Gabriel told Joseph that Mary is not lying. She, you are having a new baby. And so they met up. They went to Bethlehem, which was Joseph's old town. They ride a donkey. <laughs> I don't know. A camel. Oh yeah, a camel. She said, this donkey's fast. Well, they tried to go to a hotel and they asked the keeper um, for a place to stay. The keeper said, we have no rooms, literally no rooms. <laughs> so Mary and Joseph walked away sadly, but then he said, the only place in here in Bethlehem hand that, that you can stay, stay is a staple. And then he just pointed the way and they followed. When the shepherds were taking care of the sheep, then they saw angels. The angel said, a new baby is getting born, who is king of the Jews. The angel was singing. Glorious. And then the shepherd said, I think we should go there and meet him. The second, I think, said, yeah, I agree with you. And the other said, yeah, me too. They had to walk through a bunch of grass and bushes, maybe have to camp out at night. And then the wife then heard about it. And then a star appeared. Well, we should probably follow that star. It's pointing down to the board. So maybe we should follow it. Maybe. So the wise men went to Jesus. They gave them gifts. A stuffed animal, like a hippo one, that I have at home. Some diapers, <laughs> and some wipes, and some milk, <laughs> some shoes, some Jordans. Gold ring and Latimer. And I don't know how I would survive in that barn. Too stinky, too crowded, and ugh. I think he probably pooped because the room was very smelly. <laughs> Thank you for coming. He's adorable. He's going to be our best friend. I love you, and you're the best baby i ever seen. There, I said it. <laughs> the new baby is going to change the world. Kids tell the best stories, right? Well, good evening. I'm used to saying good morning, so this is going to be very hard for me to get used to. My name is Timothy. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. You met Bill. You met Nate. And if you're going to go in the back, you meet Dee. Uh, you saw Cy, Randy. I mean, you got an introduction to so many of our pastors here. And I am really glad that you're here, mainly because that last statement of that last line in that clip, that new baby is going to change the world. And I think that tonight that this message, that the conversation we're gonna have can literally, quite literally, change your life. And this dude is awesome. Hey, you can come up with me if you like. Feel free to join me over here anytime. You know, my, our world this last week was uh, kind of chaotic. I want to give you a picture to give you a snapshot of what that world was like. Our little guy, Micah, just wasn't doing very good. He came down with a double ear infection, 102 fever, and you just know as parents, that's not what we look forward to. Uh, it, it just kind of adds stress to the whole family, doesn't it? I mean, when your kid comes down, everybody comes down with the illness. It's not that they're sick, just everybody's life changes to that, that kid. So my, my wife was a trooper. And so she had a one-year-old who was sick and a three-and-a-half-year-old who was antsy to get outside and couldn't please either one of them. And, uh, but she made it through the week. But the entire time, uh, there just added a whole bunch of stress to the world, trying to figure out how... I'm, how do we manage what's going on here? And top that off with the fact that Christmas in itself is the most stressful time of the year. I mean, do you guys actually know that Christmas is actually the sixth most stressful life event in people's lives? 
There was a study done in London, the UK, and it was the sixth most stressful life event. I'm not talking season of the year, I'm talking life event. So you have like birth, you have deaths, you have job transfers, you have lots of jobs, and you have Christmas. I mean, it is really stressful, which is why for the past four weeks, and including tonight, we've been talking about this topic of stress. Because, because here's the deal with stress. I'm gonna do a review with those of you who have been here the past four weeks. For those of you who haven't, this is for you. Because we gotta understand what stress really is. Because this conversation is a Christmas conversation because it's a conversation that we need to have every single year at the most stressful time of the year. Here's what stress is. In the past, I've used these congas, and I know they're called congas now because I was duly reprimanded last week for calling them bongos. But um, (laughs) all of us have a plan. We have a picture of what the world and our world ought to look like. We have a plan for when we'll get married, a plan for when we'll get our first job. We're going to have a plan for when we'll graduate college, a plan for when we'll retire and how much money we'll have when we retire with, where we'll travel to or not travel to. We have a plan for the kind of family we'll have, the number of kid, kids we're going to have. We have a plan for everything. And whether you state it or not, you've got a plan. And it's in your mind. But... Then there's reality. And as long as reality is somewhat close to the plan, you're relatively stress-free. Nobody expects the reality to be exactly like it's planned, but as long as it's close, hey, you're good. But if you start moving reality, the real life, a bit away, this gap, the, the, the gap, the distance between your plan and reality where you're living right now, that gap is stress. That gap is worry. That gap is fear. Because you're realizing that you're moving further and further away from the plan, and that plan represents, in your mind, the good life. It represents security. It represents uh, uh, care and peace and all the things that really the human heart longs for is wrapped up in this actual plan coming to fruition. But when you find that your reality is over here and there's a gap there, the distance of that gap is the distance or the measure of your stress. So in this, it starts coming way over here. That, I mean, that's panic. That's fear. That's sleepless nights. That's irritability. This is, this is you frustrated. This is you coming home and taking it out on the family. This is you taking it on your husband, the people you love, because, because you had this picture of what life ought to be and the timeline ought to happen in, and reality is nowhere near that, and in fact, it's so far away that you're thinking, I can't even see the plan anymore. There's no way we're gonna get there. This is where we actually live most of our lives. This is what you're experiencing in Christmas time, and it's only amplified in the Christmas season, because isn't it true in the Christmas season, you and I become painfully aware of this gap, all of a sudden you realize I can't get my kids the things that everybody else is getting their kids. I I can't create the environment of the merriness the season should be. Um, My world really isn't as good as I hoped it would because, because family dynamics are off. I gotta see that cousin or that brother or that sister or that relative this year, and that time, that dynamic is stressful. It is not what I want it to be. It is way over here. And so this season brings with it lots and lots of stress. It's interesting because we, even with our plan that's over here, we can plan for all the contingencies that keep the reality as close as we want. We can do all the right things and still end up way over here. You can, you can save money, put it in a 401k, set money aside every month, and still end up with the money being gone. You can exercise and diet and still end up with a disease. You can do everything right. You could do everything that people call you and instruct you to do in order to realize your plan and still be way over here. There's no guarantees of the plan coming out. And that's hard for us 
to expect. And this is not, this is not a religious conversation. Can, I be, can, can we agree with that? This is a real life conversation. But it's a conversation that Jesus speaks into in incredible ways because he knows this is our real life. So regardless if you're saying, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, or I'm just here because somebody dragged me here, this is, this is a conversation that you are dealing with on a daily, monthly, and yearly basis. And I just want to invite you to consider what Jesus speaks into this conversation, because I'm willing to guess that in some way or another, you're realizing that your, your thoughts and all just aren't working out in some ways. No matter what your thoughts may be and how to bridge this gap, we all have to admit that there's only so far we feel we can come and there's so much that's out of our control. And so this this evening, I want to call it this morning, but this evening, we're going to be listening to a conversation, really an event, that none of us really consider a Christmas event because it's not about a baby in a manger, but it's about an event in which Jesus is dealing with the stress that is being produced in the disciples' lives because, because their plan is not happening. What they plan for, the reality, is something very and altogether different. And Jesus wants to speak into that event and for us speak into our lives. And you and I get a chance to watch and listen in and explore what that event was like and the lessons he wanted to teach the disciples so that you and I can learn something about our stress. But even more than that, we can learn about life in this gap. Can, I, can we not all agree the fact that we are gonna live in this gap until the day that we die? So mine as well learn what life in the gap really ought to look like. So I'm guessing that you guys, many of you haven't brought your Bible. If you have brought your Bible, you can pull it out, which is awesome. We're gonna be in Mark chapter four, verse 35 to 41. If you haven't, no worries. I'll have it on the screen for you. And you kids, in your little pamphlet or or thing you got in here, there's actually a sheet that looks like this, okay? That's our scripture. And whenever we get to one of the words with the blanks there, I'll have an underline on the screen, and I need you to help me with this conversation where you read out the word with me, okay? If you can read, that is. And parents, you can help them out to make sure they know what's going on. So pull those out, get them ready. While you're doing that, let me give you a little backstory to our event this this evening. Jesus and disciples have been teaching. They've been, they're, they're really a lot like my wife this last week. I mean, they have been dealing with people who are sick, dealing with people who are frustrated with other people, trying to instruct along the way. And after the end of the day with my wife, when I get home, she is exhausted. And they are exhausted. It's been a long day of dealing with the messiness of people. And at the end of the day, Jesus gives them some kind of instruction, and this is where we pick up in our story. Start in Mark chapter four, verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the? Okay, okay, this is not working out as I had envisioned it. The plan is not happening. Do you sense the stress? So let's move reality a little closer to the plan here. All right, let's try that again. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross the other side of the? There you go. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats did follow. But soon a fierce storm, oh, I am not doing my part now. Your plan is way over here. And do you feel stressed right now? I apologize for adding stress to your life. Let's try this again, boat. Okay, fill in the word boat there. Now, but soon a fierce? Good, came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with? Good, so here's the scene. They're in the middle of the lake. They're in the middle of this lake and the, the, the waves are building up because of the wind and the waves are starting to crash into their boat to the point where it's starting to fill with water. And it's getting to the point where it's starting to get to the top of the boat. And if the water gets to the top of the boat, they are done. Or as my son will say in our home, we're done. (laughs) And so these guys, you got to realize, these guys are, are sitting in this situation. And verse 38 says, and Jesus was... Yes, at the back of the boat. How could he be sleeping at a time like this with his head on a cushion? That's why he had a good posturepedic cushion. (laughs) The disciples woke him, shouting, Teacher, 
Don't you care that we are going to drown? Dra- drown. <laughs> Second hour, I'll do way better on this. Okay, this is, this is, this is new for me too. So here's, here's the plan. The disciples had a plan, and here's their plan. They envisioned this trip to be a twilight cruise across the harbor. They had a long day. These were experienced fishermen. They grew up on the lake, and they could see the signs in the sky, and there was no sign of a windstorm. And they expected a a gentle, relaxing, peaceful twilight cruise across the harbor. They were expecting to talk and debrief about the day and think about all that went on and celebrate, but also take a nap maybe, but just relax. And that is nothing of what was taking place. In fact, they never, 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 never thought that in a few short hours they would be fearing for their lives. They never imagined Picturing the plan could possibly be them fearing for their lives. They are over here in this experience and they are terrified. Let me ask you a question. Who decides the plan? Who decides the plan? Why? Yes, I see your hand back there. I'll call on somebody else. Why do you get to decide that you're going to live for 78.8 years, which is the average lifespan of a person today? Why do you get to decide that you get to have a house with a low mortgage? Isn't that the plan, right? Why do you get to decide that your health is going to, is going to survive and, and, be, and be health and good all the way through? Why do you, why do you get to decide that there's going to be no traffic on the freeway? I mean, that's the plan, right? Jesus is clear throughout all of his teachings throughout the scriptures that God makes the plans, as this young lady up front so astutely said. That God makes the plans. And isn't it interesting that you and I, when we make our plans, we assess whether God is being good And God is really caring for us based upon his obedience to our plan. And we assess whether or not he really loves us based upon how well he accomplishes our plan for us. But like I said, he's the one who makes the plan, not us. In fact, at one point in Jesus' life, he encounters a man who was born blind. And this man, it says, were blind from birth, and his disciples knew it, and they asked Jesus, hey Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? What went wrong, right, to bring about this blindness? There had to be an infraction or a problem that God got mad at them and, and inflicted them with this problem, this blindness. And Jesus said, neither the parents nor he but this man is blind so that the power of God might be displayed in his life. So when that guy, many years earlier, he was probably in his 30s, maybe 40s, but he was, he was a man. Decades earlier, when he was, say, 11 years old, and all the kids were running around outside, and he couldn't go out and play with them. And he was praying, God, would you just heal my blindness? This isn't fair. Why are, why? And it seemed as though in his little mind that God is nowhere in the mix. He's not even paying, paying attention to him because God's not answering his prayer. God's not healing me. Maybe God doesn't care because he's not bringing about my plan. But God had a very different plan than the one that he had. And his plan was that Jesus would actually meet him on the road 40, we'll say, years later. He was blind for 40 years to set the stage for Jesus showing up there and having an opportunity to display God's power and for him to experience the power of God working in his life. That was the plan. And it was surprisingly different than his. And isn't that the case with us? God's plan is oftentimes surprisingly different than yours and mine. God makes the plans. He decides the plans. 
So Jesus led them, these disciples, right, let's just say, right into the storm. He actually planned for there to be a storm. Jesus knew the plan and didn't tell them about it. He let them think that they're gonna have a twilight cruise. He let them think that it'd be calm and anything but what they experienced. And he didn't tell them that, that something was coming up. He led them into that. And the question is why? Why would he do that? Because he wanted to teach them something that can only be learned when the gap between what is planned and what is real is big. He wanted to teach them something about the stress they experience, about life in that gap. He wanted to teach them something about himself that can only be learned when you come to the end of yourself and realize you can't get yourself anywhere near that plan. And this is where we pick up in our story. It says, Jesus rebuked the wind. Oh, let's try this again. Jesus rebuked, the thank you, and said to the, Great. kids, you getting that? Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Now imagine what these guys were thinking at this point. Just imagine all the re-evaluation of all that took place before that. I mean, here they were, seeing the water pile in, and Jesus asleep in the back, going, how in the world is he doing that sleeping stuff? Because we're panicked, but they're taking their, their cups, whatever size cup they brought, their hands, their Dixie cups, their barrels, and trying to bail the water out to no avail, and they realize that they can't stop any of this. And they run to Jesus. And Jesus says when he wakes up, it's almost like, it's like it took him a while to wake up. He was in a deep sleep. He was enjoying the nap. And when he finally woke up, he just stood up and he said, silence, be still. Is that all that it took? Is that all that had to happen? There was never a moment in their mind's eye, prior to that statement by Jesus, that that's what he would do. They never, 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 never thought that's what would happen. They never, 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 never thought that Jesus might be in control. And there was never, 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 never a moment when Jesus wasn't in control. And so Jesus asked them two questions. Two questions they're gonna kind of cut to their hearts and help them evaluate, help them evaluate every stress that comes in their life. Every time there's a gap in their life, these two questions will help them and hopefully it'll help you. Evaluate and reassess what really is going on in your heart. So Jesus, immediately after calming the storm and they're, they're, they're retooling all that they're, they're, they've experienced, he says, why are you afraid? Now, I, yes, I, I'm terrible at this. Thank you. Let's try this again. Are you stressed or am I stressed on that one now? Why are you? Afraid. Yes. You guys are the best. Do you still have no faith. faith? Two questions. I mean, isn't it obvious why we're afraid? I mean, do I have to get more obvious to you than that? I mean, our boat is still, like, full of water, Jesus. We had an inch to go. You, what do you mean, why are you so afraid? But he was sincere about it. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And then here's how the disciples responded after they heard those two questions. The disciples were absolutely terrified. They were scared with the winds and waves. Now they're terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Let me tell you, they were afraid because they didn't trust Jesus was in control. And they didn't trust Jesus was in control because they really didn't know who he was. Because they really didn't know who he was. They thought their picture is that Jesus didn't really care. Do you not care about us? 
they thought that he wasn't really in control, that, that, that he's like everybody, he's a good teacher, he does miraculous things at times, right, but when it comes to the wind and the waves and nature, I mean, that's out of his jurisdiction. We are experienced fishermen, and when they came to the end of themselves, they come just not because they think he'll calm the storm, but because they're at the end of themselves. They have nowhere else to go, and they just said, Jesus, we, you're our teacher, so help us bail water. Help us think through our next step. I don't know what to do, but wake up. They didn't believe he really cared because he was sleeping, and they didn't really think he had control. And Jesus is saying to them the same thing he says to you, and here's the statement. You've got to remember, Jesus cares and is in control. Jesus cares and is in control. You could rephrase that, God cares and is in control. Those two statements are important to keep together because someone can have the power and not be a good person and you're going, now I'm even more terrified. And someone could be a good person and have no power like the disciples and you're still in a predicament. Jesus cares and is in control of every circumstance of your life, of every step of your journey, he cares and he's in control. And the best evidence to conclude in your mind that this is the case is the resurrection. The resurrection Jesus lost. I'm sorry, the death Jesus lost. Jesus died. He he was the one who was put in the grave and everybody who killed him felt like they had won the battle. And could we not agree that when somebody dies, you kind of think like, well, that's the end of that one. In fact, he died in the worst possible way. But what we see is that God raised him from the dead. And it wasn't just a raising from the dead, but that utter defeat, that journey into the worst case scenario became the medium of the greatest victory ever won in the world. Conquering of death. The conquering of death. Is that not the greatest fear that we have? What, this gap, all the fears we have attached to this is of death, of losing something, of, of dying to something, of missing out. It's a death experience. And God says, the world can take all those away from you and you still have lost nothing. I am still in control and I still care for you. Don't doubt that. No matter how big this is, know that I have the plan. And this gap isn't telling how far off you are of the plan, just your plan. And I've got a way better plan for you. Because I'm in control. So even though no, you have no idea how this could work out, how in the world could this scenario change, what good, you might think, can actually come from this? I mean, I, I've thought through that so many times. So, so this moves. What good really can come from this? Don't ever, ever question God's ability and desire. Don't ever question that God cares for you and he's in control. When it seems like God is not listening, when it feels like death is winning, guys, this is is the thing. Put your trust in Jesus because he does care and he's in control. Now for some of you here, you're going, well, I don't even know if I believe in Jesus. I mean, that's, that's a good story, Tim, but I don't really know if I believe in Jesus. And this is why I point you back to if the resurrection is true, if the resurrection is true, then all that I'm saying is true also. If it is not, well then you shouldn't come back here next year. We shouldn't be here next year. But if it is, then I'm telling you that when you sit in this gap and you are stressing out and you think, Lord, I don't have to be in control because you are. And even though nobody seems to care about me, you do. And I need to remind myself of that so that I don't panic but I rest with you in that storm. Because he doesn't promise an absence of difficulty, he promises to walk you through those difficulties. He promises to be with you through those. He promises to bring you through that into the end that he has planned for you. What I wanna do, I know that there's, there's a 
whole number of stresses that is filling the minds of you in this room. Some of you have come here kind of at the end of your rope. You have, you have tried everything to figure out how to get back into that. And, and, and I, and I want to pray for you tonight. I want to get a chance just for you to be prayed over. So I'm going to ask for everybody just to bow their heads. And if you would love, just sometimes the Bible calls us to just make an action, just, just a, an action with our body and saying, I would like to be prayed for. I believe that God cares for me, is in control. Would you raise your hand and say, I want you to pray for me and I will totally pray for you.